reading comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. It says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So our series on the Apostles' Creed entitled, We Believe, continues. It's where we take apart the Apostles' Creed and really determine what it means to us now. When we recite the Apostles' Creed, when we say the words, we believe, what does that mean as believers in Christ? What does that mean as a church? And what does it mean to us individually? So in our study on the Apostles' Creed, we have come today to I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. So what place does the church have in our faith? What place does the church have in your faith? You see, some people, some people put the church at the center of their faith. They believe that if they go to church and try to be good, they're set for life. They don't have much interest in And the other stuff that comes before, you know, that whole, I believe in God, the Father, Creator, uh, Jesus Christ, His Son, our Lord, uh, the Holy Spirit, you know, all that stuff. They kind of go with that uh, analogy of, you know, I just have to be there, and that counts, rather than the analogy of to be in a garage doesn't make you a car, just like going to church doesn't make you a Christian. But being active in the church doesn't save. God saves. The church would be nothing but a social club without God. It is formed, it is formed by God's grace, instituted by Jesus Christ, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. That is what the church is. Now, other people, they have kind of the opposite view of the church. They say, well, I'm a believer, but I don't need to go to church. I don't find it helpful. I don't find it significant in my faith. Now, both groups have got an issue. Both groups have failed to catch the true point. It's not about going to church. Church is really not a building. It's not an event. It's not an organization. The church is people formed by God for God's glory and God's purpose. Just like the scripture we just read, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. The whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. You are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. You see, church is not an option. It's not just this optional add-on. It's not like going to the fast food restaurant and saying, I want the burger but not the fries. you got to have the whole thing. When we are joined to Christ, we are joined to his church. So we say, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. But what does that really mean? Well, holy... Holy itself, that word means set apart for a special purpose. In the Old Testament, you know, the the items in the tabernacle, the temple itself, the priests, and even God's chosen people were designated, they were labeled as holy. They were set apart as special by God for God's purposes. God's church is holy, not... Because 
the people in the church are better than most, and I think we can all agree that that's true, but because God chose them, redeemed them, set them apart for a special purpose. 1 Peter 2.9 says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Holy is what we are, and holy is what we are called to be, what we strive for. To be. A good example is looking at the church in Corinth, the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. This is where Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, where there was issues, where there was problems. This was a pagan city, a city that didn't know God. And what was happening was the church was getting infected by the city. And so Paul wrote to them called out to them. There was issues of immorality and idol worship. There were issues where there was division between the rich and the poor. And in fact, the issues were so bad that they couldn't even have a carry-in meal without having problems. Paul wrote a letter to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. The second verse, Paul says to them, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified, which literally means having been made holy. He said, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. God had made them holy, and now he was calling them to be holy, to act like people who are special, special to God, specially called by God, specially purposed by God. So the question is, how do holy people act? Now, most people think that holy means uh, you can do this, but you can't do that. But honestly, it's not, not really about the rules. Rules can help, but the rules aren't the, the most significant part about being holy. Holiness is more than just following the rules. Romans 12, 1-2 kind of gets to the core of holiness. It says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. There's that holy word again. He said, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not be Conformed, but instead be transformed. You're transformed as you understand what God's purpose, what God's calling, what God is calling you to be. You are being transformed by Him. In Colossians 3, Paul talks to the church as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. When we understand that God has chosen us, how will we live? How will we change the way we live? You see, we can't look to our animal nature, that, that more primitive, that more animalistic side of ourselves. We need to change that. We need to, to turn away from that. Paul says, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is adultery. He says, change your words. Your words will be changed. They'll be transformed. He said, rid yourself of all such things as these, of anger and rage and malice and slander and filthy language from your lips. We'll be transformed so we see people as people and people as significant to God, as holy people of God. It's, he says, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgives you. You see, when we live 
like we're supposed to, when we live as people who are holy, when we live as if Paul's words are speaking to us, which they are, God's church will be holy, will be set apart for his glory, and used by God to reach out to the world in what? Love. That is the kind of church we want to be, we should be, we should strive to be. Now, some may have noticed I skipped over that word Catholic. And that can cause some issues for some people because they say, well, we're a United Methodist Church. We're not Catholic. Well, what's interesting, if you notice the word in the Apostles' Creed, that word Catholic is not capitalized. This is not talking about the Roman Catholic Church. That's not what we're talking about here. The word Catholic here has a different meaning. It means broad, whole, and most importantly, universal. In other words, we're saying that I believe in one true church, God's church, one unified, universal church. Ephesians 4, 3 through 6 says this. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. God's church is, is broader than individual churches or denominations. We should be unified, connected, to serve not our individual church's purpose, but God's purpose. Striving to build up the church. Not worrying about which church has more people, but worrying about, rather, where are those lost people that don't go to church, that aren't connected to a church? Where are those people? That's our purpose. That's what we're called to do. God's church includes his people throughout history in heaven and on earth. It includes Old Testament saints like Abraham, Moses, and Elijah. God's church includes his people from different cultures and races, continents. It's universal. Revelation 5.9 talks about the saints in heaven. They sang a new song. This was to Jesus. They sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe, every language, and people and nations. Did you, did you notice that? There was no group that he did not purchase through his blood. There was no part of this world where he said, but not them. Everybody. All across this land, his blood purchased the people. Sadly, it's human nature to separate. To separate others from ourselves according to wealth or appearance, education, politics, or whether they look and act like us, yet we are all joined to God's church, the Catholic church, the universal church. We are not called to separate. We are called to come together. We are called to be one. If we believe that the church is truly Catholic, truly universal, we will not compete with other churches that belong to Christ. If another church is preaching God's word, there should be no conflict. There should only be unity. We should not be looking at where can we steal people from a different church. We should instead be joining together to again find those people that don't know Christ, that are not a part of a church that are not church people. That is our responsibility. Not to build up Royal Center United Methodist Church by diminishing another church, to be, but to build it up for the glory of God by bringing in 
the unsaved. Those who are lost. Maybe even those who don't know they're lost. I know there's a lot of people that didn't realize that they were missing anything. That Well, they knew they were missing something, they just didn't know what. That's our responsibility. That's what we're called to do. So if we believe that the church is Catholic, is universal, we'll engage with a global mission of the church. The universal mission of the universal church. People like to be hands-on with mission. So they might prefer local missions, or they go on mission trips, and it helps them connect. It's a missional effort. And we should find ways to cooperate with a global church, the universal church, not as people with all the answers, but rather as partners. If we believe that the church is Catholic, we should try to bridge cultural barriers in our own church and in our own community. Look to places where we can help out. Avoiding looking at the traditional trappings. Well, we can't connect with those people because we don't speak the same language. We can't connect to those people because they have a different culture. If we don't speak the same language, then learn it. If you don't connect via the same culture, learn the culture. We have a responsibility to do just that. That's what we're called to do. We say the words, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. And then we say the communion of saints. And communion is related to community. You see, God's church is a community. A community, a fellowship. And the church is built around purposeful relationships. Let's be honest, millions of Americans every Sunday or, or Saturday or whatever day of the week they go, they go to church, but they really, really don't connect. They don't connect with others. And it, it happens in those really big churches. But it can happen in the little churches, too. Some relationships in churches are superficial. They really don't mean anything. There might be a greeter at the door, but that's pretty much it. You sit in your own little group, your own little connection, and you don't spread out. You don't go out into other areas. And, and I'm, this is a general statement made about churches. I'm not saying it's necessarily Royal Center. I'm saying it's, again, a universal thing. It's something we need to strive to take down, to remove from our churches. Even when, when, when Christians sit down together for a carry-in or, or to hang out together, we have to ask, is that the type of fellowship God is wanting for his churches? Is that the fellowship that God intends for his churches. God's vision for his people is relationships with a purpose. Paul says in Ephesians 4, 15 and 16, Speaking the truth in love, we will grow up into him who is the head. That is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Paul speaks of truth. The kind of truth that comes from someone who cares, someone who is in a relationship, someone who is willing to risk a friendship. Paul envisions, uh, describes this body where people support each other using their gifts and their resources. The body is held together by deep love, <coughs> not just for friends, but for those but for those who Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 12 as unimportant and less presentable. When relationships are personal, going to church takes on a greater importance. Hebrews 10, 23 to 25. 
says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Our fellowship, our connection to other Christians should be purposeful. So how, how can we have these kind of relationships in a church? How, does, how do we bring these about? When we sit at a table having coffee, sharing in donuts, we need to go deeper. We need to have a deeper connection. Not just the surface, but going deeper. If we go to, say, a Sunday school class or a Bible study, we can share what's going on in our lives. Share what is really going on. Listen to what others are dealing with. And ask the questions that apply our faith to our lives. We can build deeper relationships with a few people in a small group or maybe as an adult mentoring a younger person. Or with a newcomer who needs a friend who cares. Purposeful relationships. Now, right now, we're dealing with a pandemic. We're dealing with issues where we can't get together as much as we normally would like. Or we, as much as we normally would. And so we have to do things differently. We have to approach things from a different perspective. We need to look at new ways to build purposeful relationships. On Wednesdays, we have a Zoom Bible study. And you may say, well, that's no way to really connect. And if you watch our video, I record it and post it, you'll notice that it doesn't seem like we connect. But that's because a lot of that happens either before I start recording or after the, the actual recording has stopped. We do have a connection. We do have uh, personal conversations. It's not the best way. It's not the perfect way. It is a way, though. It's an approach that we can take. Now, obviously, once this whole pandemic is done, we're going to look at bringing some of that old traditional stuff back. But we also have to recognize that we have to be safe. We need to be intentional about protecting others. But how can we do that now? Many are saying, well, I can't do it the way I've always done it, so I'm not going to do anything. Well, then we fail. Because the church has to evolve. We need to look at different approaches. The gospel message will never, ever change. But the way we present it will. It has for years. This church that we have now, the way we do church now, the way we do worship now, it's completely different than what it was when it started out. Doesn't mean it's bad. It means it's different. So how can we do things differently? How can we approach things differently? How can we build purposeful relationships in a different way? We can have purposeful fellowship as we go into the world together. As we look at ways we can eventually work together on mission trips and mission projects, outreach programs, community events, this shared sense of purpose unites people. The support that we give each other when we're in a, a building project gives us new ways to connect. I've been on a number of mission trips, and it's amazing the connections you make with people when it's first thing in the morning and they are not completely woke up. There's nothing like having a connection with somebody who still has bedhead. It happens. And that's where the true connections can actually happen. When people are unguarded, when they're open, they're honest with who they really are. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. I believe in the communion of saints. I believe God's church is holy, that it is consisting of people chosen by God 
sanctified by Christ's blood, and filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe God's church is Catholic, united by Christ in spite of the things that separate us. I believe God's church is at its very core filled and designed for purposeful relationships. Do you join me in believing those things? Do you join me in believing those aspects of what the church is supposed to be? If you believe that, then how can we make Royal Center United Methodist Church more that way? What do we need to do? What do we need to change? What do we need to cut out to make it more purposeful, to make it more intentional? What do we need to do? Now, we're not going to necessarily be able to do this online like this. Because it's hard. It's hard to make those discussions work when you're not face-to-face. -face. But we can. We can start thinking, start brainstorming. Once we're able to get back together, that is one of the projects I want us to do. I want us to join together and look at what our purpose is and how we can be God's church. Believing that God brings us together for a purpose, His purpose. So what do we need to do? What is our purpose? What is our goal as God's people, as God's church? What do we need to do? If you bow with me, please.